This season, I want you to have the best Christmas ever. I know, that sounds like a really big ask. I get it, but hey, this is the only Christmas that's out in front of us right now. It's the only Christmas that we have. Me, I'm, I'm a Christmas nut. I love Christmas. Uh, this time of year, my wife needs to hide the checkbook because if she didn't, I would spend our entire life savings <laughs> on Christmas. And it's not just because I'm a pastor. I've always loved Christmas, but not everybody, right? I know. Some people are indifferent to the holiday. Some people even hate it. In fact, at least 10% of the United States dislikes Christmas. And, and people can hate Christmas for a lot of reasons. It could be the stresses of gift shopping or the pressure to keep up with the crowd. A survey asked people what they like least about Christmas or the holiday, and the top three answers either involved shopping or money. But the people who either love it or hate it are usually pretty easy to spot. I wore a Christmas sweater uh, out in public two weeks ago. So if you see someone wearing a Christmas sweater before Thanksgiving, that probably means that they love it. People who are walking around with a smile and dropping coins in the Salvation Army buckets and saying Merry Christmas to every person they meet, they probably love it. <laughs> I had my Halloween decorations changed to Christmas lights on the outside of my house the day after Halloween. But I think the opposite is also true. Those who dislike the holiday become even more grumpy. You know, we joke about the Grinch and Ebenezer Scrooge, but occasionally we could meet somebody just like that. And I get that the holidays can be stressful and commercial and can be very expensive, but regardless, I think if you're a positive person and you're building a good household all the year through, then it's possible that you could have the best Christmas ever. And I think since Christmas comes at the end of the year and it signals the change from this year to the next, what Christmas looks like depends a great deal on the year you've had leading up to it. Because Christmas doesn't just start in December. And our attitudes about Christmas don't start in December. In fact, if we're gonna take this journey together, we need to start this story a thousand years before we ever see a baby in a manger. If I were gonna tell Jesus' story, we have to go back even further. And, and this would be the same if I were telling your story, right? You might start your own story and say, I was born in Chicken Bristle, Illinois. Or you'd say, I, you know, I was bald, born in Bald Head, Maryland. But in truth, your story begins with your parents. And your story has a lot to do with the culture that you were born into and the geography of where you were born. So if we're going to tell Jesus' story, we have to go all the way back to the prophet Isaiah. Our passage is in Isaiah chapter 9, and I bet uh, you're ready to read a very popular prophecy that you always see on Christmas cards. Go something like this, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be on his shoulders. Great verse, love that verse, but we're actually going to start at the top of the page. What comes before this wonderful verse? Verse 1 starts, but there will be no more gloom. What's going on? How do we start a chapter with the word but? Chapter 9 begins with a verse that is the logical conclusion to the previous chapter, Isaiah chapter 8. Isaiah 8 was talking about a time of darkness because Israel had rejected the word of the Lord. And as chapter 9 begins, Israel says that their story is not going to end with God's judgment, that eventually darkness will lift and the anguish of God's people will disappear, and he will return Israel to glory. He will make good on his promises. And the first line of this promise is, no more 
gloom. Why? Why no more gloom? Well, because Christmas, right? Because for unto us a child is born. And you know, while the holiday is filled with all these romantic uh, Hallmark movies and sentimental songs like I'll Be Home for Christmas, still more than half of America, 55%, said that they experienced sadness or loneliness during the holiday last year. That's a lot of sadness. One psychiatrist said the holidays are tough for many people because they can trigger thoughts and feelings related to past conflict, losses, and traumas. Expectations can be unreasonably high for things to be better or different. And with social media, we are flogged with images of happy families having wonderful times, and our lives may seem lacking by comparison. If we're sad, Christmas will amplify it. If we're stressed, Christmas will amplify it. If we're angry, Christmas will amplify it. But see, this is why the child is born. The child wasn't born to make you stressed or to make you angry or to make you sad. The Christmas story begins with a promise a thousand years before he's born, no more gloom. It says, for her who was in anguish, In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the later time, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. Right? Yeah, of course. Uh, Yeah, yes. I know what you're thinking. Pastor David, now I know why Christmas cards leave these verses out. (laughs) Well, real quick. Galilee is where Jesus is from. And the land of Zebulun and Naphtali is where Jesus grew up. This is where he would have called home. But how are these two stories related? What is the story of Zebulun and Naphtali? Well, Jacob, their great ancestor, he had 12 sons. Naphtali was the second son of Bila. She was the handmaiden of Jacob's wife. Zebulun was the 10th son of Jacob. And he, he was the son of Leah. Jacob then later wrestles God. God changes his name to Israel. And now there are the 12 tribes of Israel. Well, when these 12 tribes enter into the promised land, they divide the land up. 10 of them go to the south and Zebulun and Naphtali go to the north. And this was a time when people understood that where they lived, the choices they made, affected their families. It would affect their future generations. And the last thing you would ever want to do was do something that brought shame to your family name, your clan, or the next generation. And so when the land is being divided, and they're all drawing straws, nobody wanted the north. And the north was the edge, it was the border, it was way too close to their enemies, It was near the Gentiles, near the Samaritans. And so because these two tribes felt like they got the short end of the stick, they rebelled. They were angry because they felt isolated. They're out there on the edge all by themselves with no defenses. And because they felt like they were out there alone, they started to act like they were alone. They started to act like Nobody was watching them. And Isaiah 8 paints this picture of how they acted. They lost sight of good things. They consulted mediums. They turned to witchcraft and sorcery. They pursued darkness. And eventually the Assyrians came and wiped them out. They acted poorly. They acted like there was no God. And eventually they were punished for their rebellion. And Isaiah begins with, in chapter 9, no more gloom to who was distressed. There were hundreds of years of shame for what these two tribes did, Zebulun and Naphtali, and a dark cloud hung over that land. And if you lived back then, you would avoid the north as much as you could. And this is where Jesus is from. This is where Christmas is born. He was born in Galilee. Galilee is a 
region in northern Israel. Verse 2 says, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. Zebulun and Naphtali, they did not handle their households well. Those tribes brought shame on their people, and it led to destruction. And we see a little hint of this years and years and years later in the book of John. Nathaniel, when he hears Jesus is from the north, what does he say? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? This has been taken by many to mean that Nazareth is looked down upon, even by people who lived in Galilee. Jesus' household was Galilee, Nazareth and the north, a land that had been abandoned because they had lost their faith, they had sought their own way, and those choices affected future generations. Now, today, my name is David Kenny, right? But hundreds of years ago, I would have been known as David of the Kenny clan or the Kenny household, right? Your last name and your tribe, your family, that was everything. And you acted in such a way that would bring honor to your tribe or bring honor to your household. You didn't want to bring shame to your household. And, and I think today we've lost that. We no longer think about building a household or creating a future or establishing a legacy or honoring your family name. We're much more individualistic now. We want to build our own empire. We want to build our own wealth. We are people who live for the moment. We live for today. You know, I heard someone uh, this week talk about time travel and they said, you know, in time travel movies, they're always very careful not to disrupt the past because just in case they change something, it could affect or alter the future. And the other commentator said, well, why don't we live like that every day? Knowing that the choices we make today affect the future. Why can't we live with one eye on the future? Living to build a family, living to build a legacy, to build a household. And, and I think therein lies the key to having the best Christmas ever. And it's not too early to begin. I don't care if you're in high school or college or if you live in a studio apartment and you're thinking, you know, kids, I'm not having kids for a long time. That seems like it's way off in the distant future, you know, and grandkids even further. It doesn't matter. It's never too early to begin to, de to develop and to build your household to make wise choices that affect your future, and not just your future, but the future of your family, the future of your tribe, the things we choose, the things we teach, affect our family, and our children, and our grandchildren, and our great-grandchildren. Your family name, who you are, decides what you build, and how you're known. So two things that I think this passage um, teaches us about Christmas. And the first is you're building a household. You are, you are building a household. So how will your household be known? You know, we said there are people who are angry or sad or lost at Christmas, and there could be a lot of reasons for that. Uh, but I'm gonna offer that all those reasons are in the past. A brand new Christmas is going to be here in 29 days. And, and then a brand new year will be here in just a few more. What kind of Christmas are you planning for? The, what is next year going to bring? I think you can plan for the best ever. You know, you are, you are building that household and that future right now. The choices you make will change your family. Remember, the very first Christmas was born to a people who lived in darkness with a horrible past. Jesus was born among people who had a bad reputation and they, and they just couldn't shake it. I, you know, 700 years later, born to a people who pulled the shortest straw and who lived and acted in isolation. 
born to a place that nobody wanted to visit and nobody wanted to live. And Christmas begins with the words, no more gloom. Let's not be people who cast blame and point fingers and don't take responsibility for our own actions. Let's not be people who wallow in self-pity or isolation. Let's not assume that oh, this year is going to be like last year. Or you could say, Pastor David, it's not my fault. It's not my fault. You know, I'm the victim. When we look around at the world and we see the darkness, we see it everywhere, the unsettledness, the unrest, the war. You could say, well, how could, a, how could an all-knowing, all-loving, all-powerful God allow this? Why do these things have to happen? How ironic that we're talking about darkness in Israel right now, bad choices and people who are creating a bad reputation for themselves. History has a way of repeating itself. And it's very easy to cast blame, to say, well, it's them. Oh, it's them. It's that side. No, it's that side. If only they would listen. If only they would act different. If only they would be reasonable. If only they would think more like me. Listen. God gave them free will. And God gave you free will. In fact, at the very beginning of this book, the Bible, it says God puts humanity in charge of everything. And he says all of it the world and the animals will be subject to you, us. And so if there's no peace in the world, if there's darkness in the world, if there's idolatry in the world, if there's hate in the world, or witchcraft, or hunger, or thirst, or immorality, or you have conflict in your family, or conflict in your marriage, do you know whose fault it is? It's yours. It's yours. And in truth, it's God who looks down at us and says, how can you allow this? How can you allow this? What kind of household are you building? What kind of future are you building? Every one of us, we are all interconnected. How we treat people, how we treat our bodies, how we treat our family members, the things we post on social media. In my own life, I can remember something called a private life. <laughs> See, I'm not talking about that with you. It's private. I have a private life. There is no longer privacy. You are being filmed in every store. Your phone tracks your movements 24-7. People are watching your life now more than ever. Our lives are on display for everyone to see. Family photos used to be a thing where if I wanted to see your family photos, I had to go to your house. I had to sit on your couch. I had to listen to you tell the story. I would go through your photo albums. You'd show me slides. Now it's on the internet for everyone to see. Your Instagram feed, your TikTok feed, it's out there. So now more than ever, what kind of household are you building? What kind of future are you building? You may be 21 right now, right? One day you'll be 81. You may have zero kids now, and you make choices like a person with zero kids. But one day you will be a great, great grandparent. Every choice we make has a result and a consequence for the future. The words we say, the people whose lives we touch, we have a responsibility to build our families with a legacy, to build our households. On what? Hmm, on what? What, what would we build our household on? I wanna to read to you a very familiar passage. Let's just see if this familiar passage sounds a little different in spite of what we just read, of what we're talking about right now, let's see if these words, when we read them now, take on a new meaning. 1 Corinthians 13. 
As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. In other words, all the temporary things that you think are important, all the things that you're building your life on right now, they are not foundational. They are not things to build your life on. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. And when I became a man, I gave up childish things. We all live like there is no tomorrow. That's how children live. The Bible says that's childish behavior. To live without a plan. To live without consequence. To live without thought. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now, faith, hope, and love abide these three, but the greatest of these is love. It starts right there. It starts right there. To bring light into your land, to bring light and a new start to your tribe, to your family name, it starts with Advent. It starts with Christmas. It starts with faith, it starts with hope, it starts with love. The key to the best Christmas ever is to allow the light to outshine the darkness. You're building a household. And the second thing is, you're shining a light. You are shining a light. I said Jesus had a story. I have a story, you have a story. We all have different stories. And with that, we also have different experiences. We also have different trials. For some, Christmas becomes a reminder of pain and loss. And I understand that. And I see that. For some of you, it's ages old. For some of you, it is fresh. But it's ironic that the people of Israel look down on the people who lived in the north because their entire nation had a reputation of disobedience. The Bible records seven major rebellions where God had to punish them. And when Jesus is born, they lived under Roman occupation, which the Pharisees all taught was because of their disobedience. So the truth is, everyone has a past. Not just Sabulan and Naphtali, everyone. Everyone has a past. We all have darkness. We all have things that we are not proud of. We all have memories and stories that could threaten to darken out our Christmas. But the message of Jesus is that no matter what your current situation looks like, Jesus comes to crash light into dark places. I am not perfect. I am not a pastor because my life was smooth. I carry heaviness. I know what it means to be addicted. I know what it means to be followed by shadow. And so when I celebrate Christmas, it's a choice. It's not a reflex. We all have a choice. We can choose darkness, like Naphtali and Zebulun, or we can choose the child who brought light to the world. Isaiah is written seven or 800 years ago, before his birth, before Jesus' birth. The people were promised faith, hope, and love. And then they had to wait. Generations of families had to wait for the light. You don't have to wait. Christmas brings light and life today. You know, this holiday season, I said, amplifies the kind of person that you naturally are. If you're grumpy, Christmas makes you extra grumpy. If you're nice, it makes you extra nice. But you know what? Lots of people are walking around nice this holiday season. So as Christians, I think let's, let's be more than nice. Let's bring light into dark places. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. But not just Jesus. First Peter 2 says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him 
who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You know, any other time of year, for you to bring light to the world, for you to show random acts of kindness, or for you to smile more, or for you to be helpful or thankful, or for you to invite people to church or a Christmas program or a Christmas concert or a Christmas Eve service, or you were to help somebody uh, at their house or bring them a meal or to offer a donation. Any one of those things might feel awkward during the year. Good news. Christmas (laughs) allows you to do awesome things without any awkwardness. Because someone could, hey, why did why did you, you do that? That's out of character for you. What gives? What, how would you respond? What's your answer? <laughs> it's Christmas, right? All you need to say is it's Christmas. Hey, it's Christmas. I want to invite you to our Christmas concert. Hey, it's Christmas. I brought you this meal, right? It's Christmas. If you're a follower of Jesus, let's use this time. Let's use this holiday to light up darkness. And if you're in darkness, If you're in darkness, if you feel like you have a shadow over you, let me give you some advice to chase that darkness away. Or rather, let me give you Jesus' advice. Jesus said, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That is good advice all year long, but especially now at Christmas. Christmas is not a time for self. It is not a time for selfishness. A good remedy to chase darkness away, is to do something for someone else. Chase someone else's darkness away, and before you know it, yours will be gone as well. That first Christmas really was the best Christmas ever, because hope and light had been born into a time and a place that needed it. Jesus brought faith, hope, and love back to a household who had lost it, and it's not too late. We can build our household on his, and we can have the best Christmas ever. Let's pray. Lord, I believe in you because the beauty of the world speaks of you, because the goodness of the world comes from you, because I can discern and know the truth, because the laws of the universe are ordered because your creation is sustained in being, because I'm a mystery to myself that your words illuminate, because you are the foundation of truth, because you are too great for me to fully understand, because trustworthy people have believed in you for centuries, because of science, because of the witness of the saints, because of the gospels, because you have given me the gift of faith. Increase my faith. My God, I hope in you for grace and for glory because of your mercy, your promises, your power. Lord, we hope in you because everything else decays, because you always keep your promises, because you are the king of the universe, because you created me for purpose, because I have seen your hand in my life, because your words direct me, because your goodness is the ground I walk on, because you are greater than anything that threatens me, because in history, good, triumphs, because you have sustained your church despite the weakness of men, because you have provided for me all my life, because you are powerful, because without you I would not exist, because of the witness of the saints, and I will be happy with you forever. Increase my hope. And God, because you are good, I love you above all things, and for your sake I love my neighbor as myself. I love you because you love me first. I love you because you are infinite goodness. I love you because you are inexhaustible beauty. I love you because you are unfathomable truth. Because you made the love fundamental. You built it right into our law. I would not exist without love. I love you because you created me. Because you gave me every good thing. Because you gave me faith. Because you protected me. Because you tested me. Because you trusted me with your life in my soul because you surround me with love. Lord, I love you because you died for me, because you give me deeds and not just words. Increase my love. 
Lord God, give me the faith I need to know your will, the hope I need to accept your will, and the love I need to do your will, even when I don't understand it. Just knowing that your way is better and knowing that your way brings light and that it brings Christmas. Amen. Well, I hope that you've enjoyed this first Sunday of Advent. And of course, we'll be doing an Advent uh, teaching every single Sunday from now until Christmas Eve. Christmas Eve is on a Sunday, and uh, we have a lot of things going on at the church. Of course, we'll have our Christmas concert on December 9th and 10th. It's open to the public, and we would love to have you visit. Both services are the same, so pick the one that works the best for you and your family. We'll also have two Christmas Eve services, one in the morning and one in the evening. And again, they'll be completely identical. Pick the one that works the best for you and your family. I hope you all have a very Merry Christmas, and I'll see you guys next week.